Welcome to this episode of Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge, where each week I offer 15 to 20 minute answers to tough theological and pastoral questions. This is a 100% listener supported audio ministry of relearn.org. And for those who don't know, our mission at relearn.org is to educate and equip ordinary Christians to plant biblical, confessional, and missional house churches. For more information, just visit relearn.org forward slash house. Welcome to Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge. Today we are talking about why study systematic theology. As you guys know, for those who are regular listeners to this podcast, uh, the show notes are available for you at relearn.org. Systematic theology is an important discussion. I think in the church today, we have too many Christians who have an isolated or fragmented theology and don't understand how the parts work within the whole. So today we're going to be talking about uh, not only what is systematic theology, but why every Christian should be studying systematically. Uh, But before we begin, I just wanted to make a few quick announcements. One is that I am still working hard on the new podcast format with the new YouTube video format that'll offer a, a really a training on biblical interpretation because our mission at Relearn is to improve biblical literacy. This is really what we are aiming to do is help Christians know how to read, interpret, and apply uh, the biblical doctrine to their lives. And so we really want to start uh, creating programs and initiatives and tools and resources that support that mission for you guys. And uh, that is a bit of a process. So we've got a new show format. We've got a new uh, YouTube format. We've got some other ancillary issues that we're dealing with to make sure that uh, we establish all the pieces right to make it as fruitful as possible for you guys. But just hang in in there and uh, be excited. Uh, That will be coming uh, probably in the next couple months. Uh, It might be sooner, but I'm going to just give myself some time there. Uh, Also, if you are a regular listener to the show and you are a supporter of our podcast and our ministry, I just want to say thank you so much. It really does help us continue on doing this important eternal work. And if you just take a moment and read the reviews of this podcast and how the Lord is using this podcast in the lives of Christians all around the world, uh, it would just blow your mind. So for those of you who are donating you know, $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month, $100 a month, thank you so much. If you would like to support our ministry, we could absolutely use it. There are so many res- or so many things that we would like to do that we haven't been able to do, uh, mostly just due to a uh, limit in funding. And we also want to be financially responsible uh, with this money. So we, we really want to be careful in how we manage. We're not very risky. Um, but you can do so. You can make a, a donation at relearn.org forward slash donate. Okay, um, let's dive into this discussion of why study systematic theology. I recently posted a tweet where I wrote, most modern Christians have formed their theology by people they've heard instead of by scripture they've studied. And obviously, this is a problem for a variety of reasons. We can't know our Bibles by simply allowing other people to tell us what's in it. Uh, we, we listen to podcasts and sermons and YouTube videos, and we read books and commentaries and everything in between. But the one thing that we're not doing enough of is opening up our own Bibles and reading them carefully. And not just reading it, really, it's studying it to such an extent that we can begin to see the systematic theological structure of God's redemptive plan uh, revealed in Scripture. In other words, I, I really believe that we have too many Christians and not new Christians, but people who have known the Lord for decades, who have a piecemeal comprehension of Scripture. And I, I, I chose that word very uh, intently. The word piecemeal means, and I quote, a process characterized by unsystematic discovery and partial measures taken over a period of time. And this is probably the best description 
I can think of of a modern Christian's approach towards theology. I'm going to read that again. It says, a process characterized by unsystematic discovery and partial measures taken over a period of time. So, you know, because I'm I'm going to be briefly <clears throat> defining systematic theology in this episode, I thought it was a uh, a good idea to start uh, by first defining uh, defining systematic thinking. The, si- the the simplest definition that I could find was quote systems thinking or systematic thinking is understanding how different parts of a system can influence one another in producing the whole. Now, over the last hundred years, uh, humanity has increased information, right? We're in the information age. But that doesn't mean that we've increased intellect. In fact, most sociologists uh, believe that because our minds aren't being forced to work as hard to find solutions as they did in the previous generations, that we really as a society are gaining more data, but in reality, our individual intelligence levels are decreasing. And because we have so much information available, we often approach topics and issues uh, in isolation, and we fail to see how they're connected to and have influence in other parts of their system. Uh, It's kind of like an information overload. Let's not look at uh, something more, let's not make something more complex than it really is. Let's make it simple so we isolate things instead of being willing to embrace the complexity and that this is a web And when you talk about one thing, you're really talking about a bunch of other things, how they're connected to this constellation. And our minds really want to just pull back and go, let's just look at this thing in isolation instead of diving into the complexity of the connectedness of whatever we're doing. Now, when we apply this understanding to theology in the modern church, we begin to see why uh, so many Christians have an unsystematic theology that... You know, what I mean by that is that they, they take passages of Scripture out of not only their immediate context, but their uh, canonical context. You know, that, that means their, their context within the entire Bible, the canon of Scripture. Uh, the, the word is canonical, right? It's a canonical view or a cano- canonical um, theology. It means that the theology throughout the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. So they take it out of the immediate context and they also take it out of the canonical context, and they arrive at these interpretations that neglect uh, the greater doctrines and theological conclusions by which they're divinely linked together. And let me just kind of offer you an analogy that I think might be helpful for you to see and understand what I'm saying. Okay, most modern musicians today are not formally trained. They're not classically trained musicians. Um, they learned how to play the piano or the guitar through, you know, self-teaching or peer teaching, um, you know, resources like YouTube videos or learning basic chords online or from a book. In other words, most modern musicians don't know music theory or instrumental or vocal technique or ear training. Um, you know, they can't read or write real music, like the music notes. Um, and, and this doesn't mean that they can't play beautiful music. It simply means that they have a partial and fragmented comprehension of music as a whole. And this is much like modern Christians who know some of the basics of Christian uh, theology, but don't understand systematic theology or biblical theology or Christology or soteriology and how they're all connected together. The problem arises that when people who have not been formally trained in theology— act like they have or think that they are you know, more of an expert than they are or begin to teach others as if they are qualified to do so. And I'm not saying that nobody's qualified unless you're a systematic theologian. Uh, I'm saying that we are very uh, loose-handed with this. Uh, if you look up on YouTube how to lead a Bible study, you're likely going to see lots of young people in their teens and early 20s offering instructions on how to lead Bible studies instead of church elders who have been tried and true, tested, have been trained, 
have shown the fruit in their life have decades of of study experience offering their wisdom on how to host a Bible study. And so that's kind of a small example of what I'm talking about here. And, um, you know, when it comes to training, you know, we, we have to remember, there's a lot of the people out there that are like, you know, Hey, the disciples never went to seminary. You know, they didn't get trained. I always tell people, we have to remember that Jesus chose 12 devout Jews who knew the Torah since childhood. And uh, then they spent three years under Jesus's daily teaching and gospel doctrine, all before Jesus sent them out to teach others or minister to others. So I do think there is a strong biblical argument for training before teaching others. And, um, and there is, again, that analogy between we have a similar situation going on with musicians. It doesn't mean that you can't play great music if you're not classically trained uh, or formally trained. The same thing is it doesn't mean that you can't have a really great understanding of the gospel and even preach a good sermon, but we have to recognize that there is a formal, systematic, theological uh, architecture that we should be aware of so that we can be humble enough to go, I'm operating into territory that I don't really know, and I need some help here. Instead of believing that, oh, I've read it, therefore I know it, and I know all about it, and I'm confident enough to get on stage or to preach something or to make a YouTube video about it. We just need to be a little bit more careful with that. Ultimately, we live in a culture who thinks that we are experts in a field because we read a book on the topic or took a certification class for a few weeks. Um, Again, we just need to be willing to know where we're weak um, in theology. And theology takes years, decades um, to really grasp. It, It is, the Bible is not an easy book. To understand, I would argue that it's the most complex book on earth, and uh, the theological and doctrinal structure of Scripture is probably some of the highest, if not the highest, thinking um, on earth as well. And so, uh, unfortunately, most modern Christians are weak in systematic theology because we, again, are unwilling to see how the parts are really connected to the whole, and how the whole is connected to the parts. Um, now, why is this so important that we look at theologically or theologic, sorry, theology systematically? Um, I think in the simplest terms, without sound theology, we can't rightly worship Christ. Okay, I want to say that one more time. Without sound theology, we can't rightly worship Christ. Um, in John chapter four, Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, and he explains. Uh, to her, you know, that her people, the Samaritans, were worshiping God incorrectly. Now, he closes his uh, argument, his section there, by saying, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once spoke to this concept, and he said, if we choose a false way of worship, we shall, before long, choose to worship a false god. End quote. Ultimately, what what I want you guys to grasp here is that the river of worship must flow down the banks of truth. If we remove the banks or the theological boundaries, the river begins to flow into invalid territory. And and this is what systematic theology does. It it creates banks for the river. It it gives us uh, or gives our worship really a channel or a system by which it can properly flow. It it creates the boundaries or the bounds by which we view God and prevents us from taking isolated passages and ideas and creating new canals and trenches that really lead us down to falsehood. And this is vital uh, because what we're realizing as we get older is that everything is theological. Suffering is very theological. Marriage is very theological. Depression is very theological. Parenting is very theological. Finances are very theological. The point I'm trying to make here is that sound theology cultivates a clear outlook on life. 
And the vast majority of people's trials, uh, I should say self-inflicted trials, are really a result of bad theology. Uh, A pastor once told me, if you believe wrong, you'll never live strong. And I think that's 100% correct. Um, You know, we must have a right view of God and a right view of ourselves and a right view of the bridge, that's Jesus, who spans the gap between us and God. And we have to have these right views if we're to live and think and feel and experience life the way that God intends us to. Uh, So practically speaking, where do we go from here? Um, I guess basically it means that Christians need to see both the individual parts of scripture and the whole. Uh, We need to not only know that Christ came, but also we need to know that his coming was promised in the Old Testament and why his coming is vital for humanity. You know, we, we, we don't only need to know that our sin is covered by the blood of Christ, but we also need to know why God demands blood and not water or sweat or tears. Um, we need to know that God is sovereign, but we also need to know all of the passages that define the extent of his sovereignty. And I can go on and on and on about the interconnectedness of theology and how vital it is to have a system that is not compromising itself, that's not contradicting itself. And this, uh, this doesn't mean that we remove all mystery. Uh, there are still mysteries, but there is a wonderful systematic map already developed. And I want to talk about that for a second. Um, Because I understand that this can be incredibly overwhelming. And and I admit, it is. (laughs) Systematic theology is a lifelong study. But let's just take a moment and thank God for church history. (laughs) Thank God that the Lord has raised up faithful men and women over the past 2,000 years who have stood on the shoulders of theologians who have stood on the shoulders of theologians and have codified and systematized evangelical theology for us. It doesn't mean that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it has been critiqued and evaluated for centuries uh, by individuals with, with the Holy Spirit. And those creeds and confessions that have stood the test of time uh, have, I should say, they demand our respect and they demand our attention at the very minimum. And we have these wonderful confessions and creeds. I actually did an episode on this as 125 talking about confessions and creeds, but we have confessions like the Westminster Statement of Faith or Westminster Confession of Faith and the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith that present, again, a time-tested systematic theological overview. Um, But if you want to dive deeper, we also have, you know, modern books uh, like John MacArthur's Biblical Doctrine or Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology that are incredible resources for us to start having a systematic view of the gospel, uh, of of Scripture. And so... um, I'll get ready to close out here in a second, but you know, you might be asking the question, where do I begin? I would start by reading a version of those statements of faith that I mentioned just a second ago. Um, they're available in updated language as well. So, you know, most of them are written in old English originally. Um, the Westminster Confession of Faith, you can get the original uh, Banner of Truth sells it. Um, you can also get the 1689 confession, which I personally uh, find more alignment with, even though I love the Westminster confession, I just like the way that the 1689 is put together. I think it's a little simpler to understand and it's a Baptist and I'm not a Presbyterian, um, but it's a Baptist confession and you can find that at founders.org and it's only about 80 pages. And I know that sounds like a lot, 
but you you when you read through this you go wow this is amazing uh, paul washer actually did a video on instagram tv not long ago maybe 6 months ago he was getting an interview or an, and a tour of his personal library at his office and he got over to the section that had the confessions and creeds and he said when i read these confessions and creeds i was so angry He said, I had been studying for so long and I found these books that had come and organized the conclusions that took me years to get to all in a nice book that I had never read. (laughs) And I've done the same thing. And it's amazing to go, wow, this is a great resource for my family, for our home, for our church to be a confessional church, to stand behind these interpretations of biblical doctrine. And you can um, do the catechisms that go with it. Again, some of those are available at founders.org. Tom Askell, who is the uh, president over there, I had him on an interview not too far back in the Theologian series. You might remember him. Um, Personally, for a book, if you want to dive deeper, I, I recommend... Uh, Dr. MacArthur's Biblical Doctrine. It's next to my bed, and I try to read a few pages uh, a week, and it's just a wonderful overview of the Bible's doctrine and theology and helps develop that systematic view. Uh, But overall, guys, uh, just be willing to open up your Bible. Be willing to study it. Be willing to look at the parts in light of the whole and the whole in light of the parts. And then check your interpretations, uh, not with your emotions or your experience or what somebody has told you, um, but by looking to a variety of time-tested resources and past theologians who have labored over these doctrines for decades. One thing that I do is if I want to find an interpretation, I'll find a commentary. I'll try to come to my own conclusion through prayer and evaluation of the text and the historical cultural context and the grammar. And I'll look at this and then I'll look at a commentary from the 1500s or 1600s and then one from the 1700s and one from the 1800s and one from the 1900s and then a modern one. And when I see that over 500 years, five different guys who've never met each other and likely never read each other's commentaries all came to the same conclusion it's pretty rare that that conclusion and interpretation is wrong. And so that's just a a system that I've done. So hopefully this is a helpful episode for you guys on understanding the reason why we should study systematic theology. Um, So thank you guys for listening to this episode. It's just such a pleasure to study and to share these lessons to you guys. Again, um, working on that new episode format that's coming soon. And if you want to support our ministry, you can do that at relearn.org forward slash donate. If you haven't left a review, the reviews really do help the exposure of the show. You simply just need to go to your podcast app and uh, you just tap the stars. But if you write something, I will read it. Uh, And thank you to all of you who have left those reviews. They mean a lot. Uh, On that note, my name is Dale Partridge. This is Real Christianity, and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Real Christianity. If you're a regular listener to this show, would you prayerfully consider making a donation to support our ministry efforts? Simply visit relearn.org forward slash donate. Again, that's relearn.org forward slash donate. And for those looking to explore the idea of joining or planting a church in your home, you can download our free PDF ebook titled The Basics of Biblical House Church by visiting relearn.org forward slash house. Lastly, do you have a theological question you would like answered on the show? Submit your question at relearn.org forward slash question. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Real Christianity. We will see you next Wednesday.